the thought is running high You bring the broken back to line Only you can, only you can You set me free from every chain You fill my heart with songs of praise Only you can, only you can Jesus, you're the only reason That I'm even breathing I am wide awake
Town South by mail, by using our offering boxes located in our lobby, the website, or using our app. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, our praise continues as we bring our offerings. You are the Lord of life, and you've given us life. You've not just given us this physical life here and now, but through the gift of your Son, we have hope for eternal life because of his sacrificial death. Father, because of your gift of your Spirit who dwells within us, we have the capacity to lead holier and holier lives and to bring honor and glory to you, to be one with you, have abundant life. Father, because of your love, we have each other as we're bound together in this family with the body of the church. We thank you for the fellowship we share. As we look around us, we see blessing after blessing. There's every reason for our praise to continue. We pray that you'll accept the gifts of our offerings because we love you and we're so grateful. We praise you in Jesus' name. Please stand to continue worshiping with us.
be seated. Recently, I had the privilege to read a book by the academic dean at uh, Ozark Christian College based on the book of Hebrews. He made a comparison in that book that I had never thought of before. And when I read it, I said, boy, I hope somebody doesn't beat me to this for communion meditation. But he likened the wedding band. He says, every time I look at my wedding band, I realize the covenant that exists between my wife and me. And then he went on to say, and by like token, every time I meet around the Lord's table, I'm reminded of the covenant relationship that God established through his son, Jesus Christ, by his death on the cross. And that reminds me one more time of that relationship. I'm part, I, I'm glad that I'm part of a tribe that observes the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day because we get that good reminder week after week after week of the price paid for our souls and the assurance of life everlasting. I want us to do a little bit different this morning. I want us to partake in unison. So if you will get your communion out and if you will lift the side with the bread in it, as we remember that his body was shed. Y'all, I don't know if you saw the passion play or not. That was so unbelievably moving as we looked at just how much his body suffered as they beat him. You could not have recognized him by the time he was on that cross because of all the suffering he had before he ever got there. And so his body was given that we might live eternally. As we remember his body, let's partake of the bread. Father, we thank you that even though he could have refused to go to the cross, he could have called a legion of angels at any time to lift him up out of that. He went there for us. We thank you, what it, thank you for what his body suffered that we might live eternally. Now let's open the juice that reminds us of this blood that was shed. The thorns piercing his brow and the blood running down. The blood out of his hands as the spikes were driven through. The blood from his side as they pierced his side that blood that cleanses us from all sin. Let's partake. And we thank you, Father, that he was willing that his blood might be shed to wash away our sins. The sinless one dying for us sinners. Thank you, Lord. We pray it all through his name. Amen.
Good morning, Town South family. <laughs> Boy, you are in for a real treat today. We have a guest speaker with us, Dr. Pete Kunkel. Uh, I have known Pete Kunkel for most of my ministry life. I met him early on uh, when I had a ministry in Plymouth, North Carolina, my first ministry, and uh, knew him through a number of uh conferences or revivals or different things that we had been in and I, I had seen him and then uh, I ministered in Ohio for seven years while I was up there uh, we had Pete come up and do a leadership retreat with the leaders in the church in Ohio I've been back down here in North Carolina and been at this church for the last uh, 15 years working on 16 and uh, a few years ago we had Pete come and meet with the elders here and go through a leadership retreat uh, Pete has been in ministry for 37 years. In uh, 1987, uh, he uh, planted First Christian Church in Kernersville, North Carolina with about 62 people. And uh, today they're running 2,400 in two campuses. And uh, he retired back in August of this year. And now he is the executive director for Hasten International. Hasten International is a medical mission. They are on three continents and six countries. And uh, he had called me a little while back and asked if he could come speak to our missions team. And I said yes. And I thought, if you're going to be here talking to our mission team, you might as well preach. And so uh, anyway, uh, give him a, a good welcome, Pete. We appreciate you being here. <laughs> Thanks, Brad. Boy, it is so good to be here. You know, Brad and I have had a long history, and uh, he's just a phenomenal guy. And I'm going to tell you, when I was looking for somebody to take my position, because uh, we had to hire somebody, and then I mentored them for two years so that they understood the structure, knew the staff, and the whole nine yards, I actually looked at Brad. I didn't propose it. And then I realized what a great job he was doing here, and this may be the church to go over 1,000 in this portion of North Carolina. You have tremendous potential here. You've got great people. They're friendly. They're loving. And, and you've got the component that makes for a great church. I left uh, after 37 years. I retired on August 31st, which is my birthday, so I could remember when I retired as I get older. And then I started my new job on September the 1st. So there was no time away, no time off. Uh, I shot right into it. And God... It really revealed some things to me. I've been the chair of the board for Hasten for 18 years, and I've been with them 37 years as just a volunteer. And uh, Dr. Pruitt asked me a number of years ago, probably 15 years ago, would I be the executive director one day? He had passed away, and he's been gone for almost 11 years now. And he was the founder of that organization, and he had mentored me all that time. Had gone to the church where I was at. He was my personal physician. Uh, just we had a great relationship and uh, when I took the position God laid on my heart that there were two things that we really needed to do number one we needed to open a clinic in South America I don't know what you're reading about South America we decided to go to Colombia South America and uh, it is exploding in evangelism people are searching out Jesus so we hired two young doctors a dentist and a physician and uh, set up a clinic, and we do mobile clinics there. Actually, I'm going in March. Uh, I'm taking four doctors, two dentists, and they're going to assist and, and come in and help my young doctors as we work in some of the jungle areas. And the way we do that is we have churches in those areas, and it may be a hut, maybe pretty wild out there, but we will have electricity, and we will have the capability of doing the work that we need to do. And during that time, we evangelize. We share with the people from the villages, and it has been extremely successful for us. But then God laid on my heart that there was a component missing, and that component was here in the United States. That um, when I was at First Christian, we had a food truck, and we would go on rescues and hurricanes and floods, and, and we would go to low-income areas and feed people on a weekly basis when COVID hit. Uh, we fed people every single night for a year and a half. 1,600 meals a night were totally free. It was for people with COVID, people who 
uh, had lost their jobs because of COVID. I saw so many young moms with their children living out of their car. It was horrendous. And, and we were able to take care of that. And I thought, you know, some of these people need medical and dental care. And uh, we had the opportunity, Hasten did uh, a few months ago, to buy a trailer, which we're converting into what we want it to be, which will be a dental suite in the front, counseling center in the middle, and a uh, doctor's examination in the back. This thing is the size of a semi-trailer. And uh, it's already upfitted. Dennis owned it. He had it for two months, had a massive heart attack and died. His wife couldn't pay for the trailer. It went in, uh, was repossessed to the bank and sat there for two years. So it needs some work inside for us to use it in the state of North Carolina. It came out of Georgia. And the key to this is not just doing medical and dental and counseling, but to give these people Christ. It's the one thing that we can give that other people don't give in this profession. And we want to share the message of Jesus Christ. So we will incorporate churches in the area in which we go. And one of the reasons I came down here was to scout some of the poverty areas. I've met with some of our state senators and they said, you need to look at this and this. So I, I'd done that this past week when I came down. And uh, I have identified some really severely poor areas. And there's some in Elizabeth City. I went through a section of town not too far from the college. And uh, a lot of poverty there. And uh, we would set up our clinic, and then the church would come in and do ministry to the people. You know, it's one thing to go in and do something for a person, but not to follow up. And the church can follow up by inviting them to church and incorporating them and especially children, it's so easy to evangelize them and invite them to your church and make a difference. You know how I got to church? Uh, I was an unchurched, uh, first-time American. Uh, I came here from Germany. My mother was an unwed mother, and, and we came here. She married a soldier who brought us to the United States. They were very poor. I didn't realize it when I was a kid, but I know it now. And uh, there was a lady who came to me and invited me to church. And uh, it was VBS. Any of you ever been invited to VBS? The problem was I didn't know the rules of VBS. I got thrown out of VBS after the first night. I'm ADHD. You just can't tell that, right? And uh, I was a little wild, and, and I thought, okay, that's not going to be the place for me. And then in my teen years, I met a youth minister who really changed my life. And, you know, I was a kid across the tracks that you really didn't want in your youth group. And, and he made an investment in me, and it changed my life. And I think you can do this. The medical's the bait. It just gets them to you. And then the church can share into their lives. And I got something really neat, and I didn't say this in the first service, but we have uh, the VR units that you put on your head. There's a man in Thomasville, North Carolina, multimillionaire. And he came to me and he said, hey, I'm doing a project. I want you to test it. He put the entire Bible, visual Bible, on these headsets. So you can prepare to fight Goliath. You just can't cut his head off. We, we don't do that graphic part. But you can prepare and they launch tomatoes at you with slings. And you've got to protect yourself with the shield to get ready for the battle that you're going to enter into. It, it's just enticing. You know, I did it for about 15 minutes, got dizzy and fell down on the ground. And I said, no more of that for me. It's for young people only. And then we have some child centers where the kids can come and they can play as a dentist. They can play as a doctor. They can take blood pressure. They can use stethoscope. So we have prepped this so that you can be successful, but we can't do it without the church. We're just providing the vehicle, all the materials and the things that you'll need. And then you'll provide the dentist, the doctor who will volunteer their time because if I have to pay everybody, I can't afford to run this trailer for free. And then church come and help witness and care for these people, register them, keep the records. It's going to be a great thing. So I want to invite you to think about that, okay? Uh, you'll hear a lot more about it as we get this trailer upfitted and get it on the road. But today I want to ask you a simple question. Do you want to be well? That's a pretty simple question, isn't it? Say yes or no. For most of us, you know, sometimes things aren't what they seem. And I'm going to change my illustrations, Bill, just for you because you're 
in here is the second service, so I'll change this up a little bit. But uh, I was speaking for a group called Promise Keepers, and I was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, the group that I was with, we decided to go to McDonald's. And at that time, if you remember me way back, you know that I weighed about 378 pounds that time. And uh, we all had on these white shirts with Promise Keeper logo, and, and I was getting ready to go speak, and we stopped at McDonald's, and I opened one of those ketchup packs. You ever done that? It was not a good experience. Blew up on my shirt. Now I'm going to speak in front of thousands of people, and, and I learned a long time ago, and this actually works. You test me on this. I was with my wife, and I had some stuff get on my shirt, and this guy who didn't speak English started throwing salt on my shirt. No warning, just was doing it. And I'm going, what are you doing? And don't touch, don't, no touch. And uh, he covered that thing up, and then he said, go to the bathroom after a few minutes and just rinse it off. And what happens is salt iodizes that stain and will pull it out, and then you can just wash it off. Well, I was putting salt on my shirt. And, you know, in McDonald's, the way they used to be, they had those short walls, and people would look over, and there was this little kid looking over the wall at me. And he looks at his mom, and he says, Mom, Mom, that big guy's going to eat his shirt. <laughs> Misconceptions. And sometimes when we hear from God, and we, we know that there are certain things that the Bible says prescribes to us to do, and then there are times that God prompts us to do some of those things. And and we don't necessarily want to take all of those steps. And the background story of this is in chapter 5 of the book of John. And we're going to start with verses 1 through 4. And it says that Jesus went up to Jerusalem to one of the Jewish festivals. Now there was in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. I want you to underline that. Used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And they were waiting for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down, stir up the waters, and the first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease that they had. You know, I have seen some miraculous things that I cannot explain. I've seen people be prayed over and anointed, and our elders practiced that at the church I was at. And I saw people, their cancer, be gone, uh, tumor. And I'll tell you a story at the very end of this that is just phenomenal to me uh, for this young lady. But God does things. How many of you believe that? The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament, too. There is power in the name of Jesus. Not my power. I'm not a miraculous healer. Don't have that capability. Wish I did. If I did, I'd go to Baptist Hospital, the children's ward, and I'd clean it out. There wouldn't be a sick child in there. Then I'd go down uh, to where the other hospitals are in High Point and Greensboro and Durham, and I would do the same thing. But I don't have that power, but I do have the power of prayer, and prayer changes things. And in verse 5, it says, one who has been there an invalid for 38 years. Since the time of his birth. And, uh, you know, he'd never been able to get in those waters. Now, if that were me, I would get right on the edge of the pool and roll into it. Just kind of flip in there and, and be the first one in. But I've often asked myself the question, why this guy? Why out of all the people laying around this pool who needed healing, why does Jesus pick this man? But you go back to they used to lie here. Maybe Jesus healed everyone that was there that day. I don't know. You know, some stories that are shared out of Scripture don't describe the whole thing, and John talks about that. It filled volumes and volumes of books. But this one man... You ask yourself the question, why him? He's 38 years old. Roman history says that the average male in that time period lived to be about 40 years old. So maybe Jesus just wanted to give this guy a chance before his life was over. 
and allow him to do something that he'd never done before. In verse 6, it says, And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? That seems like a crazy question, doesn't it? For somebody who's been an invalid for 38 years, do you want to get well? You know, in doing ministry, I completed between all my ministry life, I completed 46 years. And I told my wife, I just can't go sit down and do nothing. You know, I'm healthy, I've got a lot of energy, and I still want to work. But I've realized in that 46 years of ministry that a lot of people do not want to be healed. They talk about it, but they never make the steps to accomplish it. And you know, a lot of us are that way. We say, well, I I need better health. Then I'm going to quit smoking. I'm going to quit drinking. I'm going to quit drugging. I'm going to quit running around and having sex with every person in the world. You got to make decisions. But sometimes we're not willing to make those decisions. And the last year of my ministry at First Christian, I buried 20 young people who had all died of overdose. The hardest one of that group was a young Marine. He had been injured in Iraq, and uh, he was in so much pain all the time that he reverted to heroin, which was not his healer. It was his death now. And uh, he was a wonderful kid. I knew him since he was born. He worked on my farm, ran around with me. We rode four-wheelers together. None of these kids were strangers. I knew their name. I knew who they were. And now I'm standing over their grave and I'm putting them into the ground or putting them into a vase. A lot of people are being cremated and and I'm thinking this didn't have to happen. But as much as you want people to be healed, as much as you want their life to change, they have to want it. You can't change someone who doesn't want to be changed the hardest lesson of my ministry because I wanted it for them. I wanted them to see fulfillment in their life. I grew up around alcoholics all of my life and I knew I was not going to be an alcoholic because what I'm going to do, I'm not drinking. You see, there are two types of alcoholics, people who do a frequency and become alcoholics and then there are the chemically addicted alcoholics. Once they do it, they can't stop drinking. They just keep drinking and drinking. And I said, I'm not opening myself up to that. I don't do drugs. Won't do drugs. I don't even do painkillers. I did Tylenol. had some major surgeries, and there was some major pain with that. But I did not want to get hooked on something that was going to take me over. And sometimes you just got to make decisions. And I'm not saying don't take drugs when you have surgery or things that you need. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying be careful in what lane you travel, how far you walk. There's a group, and as I was doing research for this sermon, this popped up, and I went, nah, that can't be real. And I Googled it and checked it, and it is a real disease. And they're called the transabled. They choose to identify as handicapped people. Now, this is the unbelievable part. The condition is called BIID, Body Integrity Identity Disorder. And incredibly, these people will go to doctors and ask to have perfectly healthy hands, arms, legs, feet amputated so that they can be disabled. Many of them go as far as asking a surgeon to sever their spinal cord so that they're paralyzed from the waist down. If you don't believe it, just check it out. You can Google it up and and see it. It blew my mind. And it made me realize how sick people are today and how much they need God, how much they need Jesus. And they seem to surround us. They're everywhere I go. One of the things that we did with the food truck is every third Sunday morning at 5.30 in the morning, we loaded that thing up. And we went to a park in Greensboro and ministered to 150 homeless 
had a lot of different volunteers go with us, and we fed them and cared for them and gave them supplies like toothpaste, deodorants, wash rags. In the winter, we'd bring hats and socks and gloves and, and all kinds of things, and we built community with them. And many of them were veterans, and they couldn't live in a house. We tried to transition them, stayed for about a month, and then they came out and said, I'd rather live outside in the tent. I'm just, I feel safer out there. And that was one of the conditions I just wasn't considering. But those people needed help, and when we get the medical vehicle up, we're going to go there, and we're going to minister to those people because a lot of them need medical and dental care. But you have to want it. You have to exercise your right to find healing. In John 5, 7, the guy goes, Sir, the invalid replied, and notice we don't know his name, and I think that's really curious too. I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down in front of me. Did you notice something obvious here? He doesn't answer the question. Jesus didn't want the excuses on why he hadn't been healed. He wanted to know, do you want to be yet well? Yes or no, right? It's pretty simple. But he gives excuses. I can't get anybody to help me. I can't get to the, to the edge. I can't get in the water when it's stirred. He has no idea who he's talking to. He absolutely has no idea who healed him because later on in the passage, he runs into Jesus again and he says, stop sinning or worse things will happen to you. But Jesus looks at him in John 5, verses 8 and 9. And Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. And at once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat, and he walked. You see, the first step to healing is you got to get up. About 15 years ago, I had a hip surgery. And I was talking to a gentleman. He said he had two within three months of each other. I'm going, no, nah, not me, man, because that killed my leg. I mean, I didn't get any feeling in this leg for over a year. I thought the surgeon I had messed up and cut all my main nerves. And he said, no, 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 Pete, it, it takes a year. Well, I go through the surgery, and I'm in the hospital bed, and it's only been about two hours since the surgery. And, and this nurse, and she's pretty good size, she comes in and she says, Mr. Pete, you're getting up. I went, and I wanted to say it, but I didn't say it because I'm a preacher. <laughs> Are you nuts? Do you not realize I just had this surgery two hours ago? Oh, yeah, I know when you had the surgery. But we need to get you up and, and out of bed. And I couldn't move this leg, so she showed me how to shift my legs to the end of the bed, and she stood me up. And I went, I didn't, that didn't hurt. Now, what I didn't realize is I was on a lot of medicine. You know, that did kill a little bit of the thing. But we walked to the door in my room, and then she put me back in bed and helped me show me how to get my legs back in. And uh, the next day, we went out in the hall and walked a, a line out there. And then the third day, we walked around, did about two or three laps. I can't even remember. And I felt great. And the fourth day, I was back in my office. And, you know, the key to that was to get up. Any of you have problems getting your teenagers to get up? Yeah, I told this in the first service. Uh, my daughter was really hard, and she really did not like to be awakened in the morning, but she had to go to school. So I bought her this huge alarm with these big bells on it. She had no idea, and I had set that for the time she needed to get up and go to school. And all of a sudden, that thing goes off, and it, I mean, it was loud. It was all over the house. She jumps up, and I hear something hit the wall. And I go in the room, and that alarm's no good anymore. But it cured her of staying in bed when it was time to get up. She then learned how to get up. Because you can't get moving if you don't get up. Amen? You can't get away from your sin until you get up and face Jesus and realize that you're a sinner and that you are saved by his grace. And that he loves you and that he's chosen you, but you have to choose him back. Then you have to die to your sin. 
You have to be buried with Christ and rise again to walk in the newness of life. And when that happened to me, I didn't look back. I am not perfect. I don't walk a perfect life. I wish I could, but I'm trying the best that I can. I, I still sin as a, as a believer, as a Christian, but I sin less than I did before. And I know my direction. I know where I need to go and what I need to be. So at some point, friends, you got to get up. You've got to make the decision that you want healing, and that's moving toward Jesus. Then you've got to pick up your mat. You see, one of the hardest problems of an addict is going back once they've gone through treatment. I had a young guy. He'd been in treatment for six months, totally dry. You know, they'd gotten all the drugs out of him. He goes home. And I find him dead at his bed. His mother called me, and EMS was coming, and he had a needle sticking out of his arm where he'd shot up. That's what we call a hot shot. And, uh, you know, when you do drugs, you, you do not want a hot shot. A hot shot is what will take your life. And they just put a bigger dose of that chemical in there, and when it hits you, it ex just explodes your heart. And you never know when you're going to get one. But... but Dealers are very inclined to do that, to get people back into their behavior. And I can still see him. His name was Rob, and he's sitting by the bed in a T-shirt and jeans with his head down and the needle sticking out of his arm because his mom and dad wanted him to get well. And he played the game until he got out, and then... He wasn't convicted, but he wanted to be well. Do you really want to be well? Then you got to pick up your mat so you can't go back there. I'm done with it. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to live this life. I'm going to change my friends. Because sometimes friends pressure you into situations. Amen? And I, I don't know how many parents I'm talking to in here who have experienced some of these addictions and, and know how destructive it is in a person's life. But you got to decide that you're never going back. Jesus compares going back to your sin like a dog going to his vomit. That's a really graphic picture. Isn't it? But he wants you to be free. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to be healthy. I've never gone back to that obese style because I knew what it was and I knew what it takes to stay away from it. And it's not always easy, but it's beneficial because Dr. Pruitt said you will be dead by the time you're 50 if you don't get rid of this weight. And I took it to heart. And then you got to walk. And I will tell you that the walk in Jesus is not always easy. Sometimes it's even harder when you become a Christian, isn't it? And there are highs and there are valleys and lows, and, and it's a tough journey. But the good thing is I can look beside me and go, Jesus is right here with me. He hadn't left me. I'm not alone. And I look around the church and I have friends who are lifelong friends and they're praying for me. I do a men's group every Thursday morning at 6 o'clock in the morning because these guys got to go to work. And uh, I've been doing it for years, and I rotate a group of guys. After a two-year period, they've got to start their own group or move to another group. But I work with a lot of young guys who are young married. They're raising kids. They're newly married. Uh, they struggle with different issues in their life, and we get down to brass tacks because those six guys sign a covenant that they're not going to discuss what we talk about in there. And that we're there to help each other and to encourage each other. And we're reading the word and the word is giving strength. You know, if you don't eat of the bread, you can't get strong. Amen? It's a, it's a true issue. I've got to be in the word to find where God wants me to be and what he needs me to be. But I've got to begin to walk in that life and walk away from my past. And today, that's where I'm coming to you from. You need to get up, wherever you're at, 
and you need to start moving and you need to leave the stuff that held you or bound you and cut it loose. Because in actuality, those are chains and chains will hold you and take your life. I remember going to a a prison and uh, the kid had grown up in the church and he decided that some of his friends were going to rob a food line and he was going to let them in the back door. He had no idea they were going to come in with automatic weapons and and they came in and robbed the store, beat up some people and uh, he had let them in. Now, nobody knew until the investigators started and and then they sentenced all three of them. And basically, they sentenced them with the same crime. And uh, for the next 21 years, he was going to be in prison. And I went to see him, and his face was all scarred up and beat up. And uh, he said, Pete, I don't know if I can live like this. I just don't know what I'm going to do. And I said, there's a chaplain here, and there, there's a group at this prison. And one of my friends will be in there in just a few weeks, and he's going to lead some worship, and, and he's going to preach, and I want you to go to that service. His name's Barry McGee. He actually works for Hasten International now. And uh, Barry met him and, and just kind of grew to love the kid. And uh, it was life-changing for him because every week he had some hope. And to be a Christian in in a penitentiary is really a difficult thing to do. But it is the only place where you can find true transition and hope. I told you that I believe in in healing and we pray for people. It was a little girl, her name was Maddie Rose. And Maddie's parents were good friends of ours and uh, they were new Christians in the church for about two years. And... uh, The mother got pregnant, and uh, she had Maddie, but when she had her, she had strep. And that is almost always fatal to a baby. They don't generally survive. And and Matt called me, and he said, hey, could you get some of the elders from the church and come and pray for Maddie? Uh, They don't give her much time. So we go to Baptist, and we're in the NICU in the intensive care unit. And I'll never forget this nurse. She said, what are you all doing here? This baby's not going to live. And uh, one of the doctors who goes to our church stepped up and said, you need to go get some coffee. You need to leave this area. And told the nurse, move on. And uh, we had a little vial of oil, and we put it on this little baby. And she was ash gray, not responsive whatsoever. And I just rubbed it on her head, and then all the elders gently laid their hands on her and prayed over her. Within two hours, she had turned pink. And nobody could answer this, okay, other than God had moved. Not us. We're not miraculous. We have no power in this other than the prayer, and we followed exactly what James 5 said to do. So she comes out of it, and she has some issues. She had a heart defect because of it, and, and, you know, her walking isn't like everybody else, but she facilitates for it. And uh, it was the coolest thing four months ago. Uh, She got married, and I did the wedding. And it was on her mom and dad's anniversary, who I'd married 34 years before that. I believe. I want you to believe what I believe. I believe God's still God, and he's still doing his work among his people. I see a lot of stuff with this medical mission. I've been to 38 different countries, been all over the world. But I've seen God do some really cool things. And you know, the cool thing about Hasten, and we're the only organization that can claim this, is all of our doctors preach. And they all have churches on Sunday. They'll take that clinic, tear it down, set up all the chairs in there, and the DeMays and the Dominican will have 250 people in a room about this big, right here at this highway. And it's so stinking hot in there, I just melt down. But I preach my heart out because they've come to hear the gospel. 
And you've been around and preached in different countries, Bill. They don't want to come for a 20-minute sermon, do they? They'll be there for six hours, seven hours worshiping and, and praising God. And it's just such an atmosphere. And I'd love to see America revived. Amen? We need it. And maybe this is a pathway to doing that where we're bringing in people and we're ministering to them health-wise, but we're also giving them eternal hope and eternal strength and we're connecting them with the church and they feel value like I felt value back in that day when one person said, I believe in you. I want you to be a part of the church. I know that you don't go to church. I know that you haven't been in church, but I want you to be a part of the church. And that's something that I saw Bill doing this morning. I don't know what time I got here. A little after eight. He's out in the parking lot in his coat and his hat and he's calling out people and he's meeting them. Do you know what good that does for the kingdom? It's immense. One of the things I did for this church years ago was evaluated its friendliness. And I came in, people didn't know who I was, and I just graded the church and how it did and how it reached out. You all passed with flying colors this morning. Because most of you didn't even know who I was, and you were coming up, hey, how are you? Where are you from? What are you, what are you doing? And, well, I'm the guest preacher today. Oh, cool. Hope it's good. <laughs> Can't speak to that. But I want to tell you the last thing, because this is why I do ministry. My last Sunday was, whew, it was an emotional Sunday. I did three services that were all packed. We were doing baptisms, and people wanted me to baptize them because I was leaving, and they had planned on that, didn't know when I was going to retire, and now the time had come. And I don't even know how many baptisms we did that day, a lot. But I was getting ready to come out of the baptistry after the third service, and there was a little girl standing up on the platform. She was 12 years old, dressed in this beautiful dress, beautiful hair, had a little bow in her hair, and... And she was just sweet as could be, and I've known her for years and years. And she said, uh, Mr. Pete, I want to get baptized this morning. I want my sins washed away. And I said, well, why don't we take you in the back, and one of the ladies will get a gown on you, and, and we'll bring you in. And she said, no. You said, come as you are. So I'm coming. And she came down that baptistry, had her little dress on, and and I gave her some instruction, and I baptized her. And I lifted her up, and the place exploded. Just hundreds of people clapping, cheering, whistling. What a celebration. That little girl wrapped her arms around my neck and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Because what I didn't tell you was she's raised by a single mom who has two little girls. She does her best, and it's hard at its best. Her husband cheated on her, left her. She has all the responsibility. And she said to her daughter, you know, this might not be the best day. And her daughter said, this is what I need to do, Mom. And she just walked up because her mom didn't want to come to the front. Too many people, you know, that people shock. And it was one of the greatest days of her life, too, because there was now hope restored into her life through the rebirth of this daughter. That's what I get to do. And those are the greatest moments of your life. But you got to get up. You got to pick up your mat. And you got to walk. And for some of you, today's that day. So we're going to sing a hymn of invitation, I think. Maybe I went short or long. I don't know. They'll be up here. But I want you to find your way to Jesus. And then once you find your way, I want you to show somebody else how to get there. That's why this church is growing so much. It's because you've not only found your way, but you're showing other people how to get where they need to go. So I'm going to pray, and then Brad's going to come up and lead the invitation. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come, and 
there's so many people here, and I don't know most of them. Never met me. But they've met my Jesus. And I would know that more than anything, you want to be there, Jesus. You want to live in them. So, Lord, I pray for each person here. No matter what they're facing, no matter what their sin is, addiction is, whether it's pornography or alcohol or drugs or control, anxiety, depression, all the different things that come at us and burden us so heavy and push down on us so hard. Lord, I know that they can be free. I know that you can lift that from them, but they have to want it. And the first thing is to get up and to move away from So, Lord, we just pray that you would be with them. And where there's medicines required, that they would take the medicines. Where there's counseling required, that they would get the appropriate counseling. But we know that you're the first step in that that place of healing. Because you love us so much, you want the best for us. And we can trust you by putting our hands in your hands. Letting go of what lies behind and stretching forward to that which you promised to us. So, Lord, help us, guide us, and strengthen us this day. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pete. Thanks, Pete. Mm -hmm. Do you want to get well? Well, that's not just a great sermon. I think that's that's a great question for us to consider right here, right now. Do you want to get well? We, We all have struggles, and no one, no one has it all together. I've been a Christian for a lot of years, and there are many people that have been Christians longer than I, and we don't have it all together. And there's no way we could get it together if it were not for Jesus, if it were not for his forgiveness, if it were not for his healing power in our lives. But Father, that that place, that place where you get up is the place where you recognize Jesus as Lord and you accept him as your Savior. That is the moment when you surrender to him, when you're baptized into him, that is the beginning of your healing. And I can tell you one day you're going to be made completely whole. The Bible says when you see him, you will be as he is. But until that day, we need Jesus. We need his forgiveness. We need his power. We need his healing. We need his guidance in our life. And so I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know where you are in your walk with the Lord. But maybe today is the day that you get up. You walk down this aisle. You walk toward Jesus. You surrender your life to him. And you begin that healing process. And the promise is one day you will be completely whole. But in the meantime, we'll have struggles, we'll have ups, and we'll have downs. But in the midst of all of that, you know what? We can have peace because we know we're saved. We know he's coming. We know we have the promise of heaven, and he is with us in all those ups and downs. So you come today if you have a decision. When we sing this next song, you walk down the aisle. We'll lead you in what you need to do. If you're already an immersed believer and you're looking for a church home, we want to partner with you and the work that God is doing in this place. And I would love to talk to you about that as well. But you come with your decision while we stand and sing. Let's stand.
thank you, Pete, for being with us today and sharing that message with us. Uh, Pete's going to be down front here at the end of the service as well as myself. If you uh, like to talk with him and, and meet with him, I encourage you to do that. If you're a guest with us today, we're so glad that you're here. I'd love to have the opportunity to meet you if you'd come forward. And please uh, stop by the new here station out in the lobby and fill out a card. And our challenge to you, if you're a guest with us, is to give us five tries. We don't think you can really experience all that Town South has to offer, understand who we are or what we're about in two or three tries. Give us five tries. And so fill out a card at the new here station so we can track you and uh, follow up with you and see if we can help you in any way. If you have young people, 7th grade through 12th grade, um, we have our Carolina Christian Youth Conference coming up. The deadline and the details for that are coming up. The uh, information is in the bulletin, so we encourage you to register for that. Also, uh, if you've been worshiping with us a while and you haven't gone to the Next Steps class classes, we encourage you to do that. Next week during the 1030 service, we have our Grow Together Next Step class and uh, encourage you to register and attend that. Let's just all close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be together today. We're thankful that uh, we can call you our God, our Father, our Lord, our Savior, our great physician, our friend. Lord, uh, help us to realize as we leave this place today that we do have a message that can make a sin-sick world well through the power of your son, Jesus. Help us to share him with others as we go. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.